Good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to begin now with uh, what I believe is going to be a rather special monthly lecture. And uh, I say that I'm slightly party pre because uh, until recently, before I became the rector of the IVM, I shared the same profession as uh, tonight's lecturer, which is Natalia Gumenyuk, and that is we're both uh, journalists. And uh, Natalia is from Ukraine, and so I don't really need to introduce what she's going to be, what she's going to be talking about, but I do wish to introduce her as she has been specializing in foreign affairs and conflict reporting. She also set up a television station, which is in itself quite an uh, exacting task. Um, Natalia holds a bachelor's degree from the Institute of Journalism uh, at the Taras Shevchenko National University in Kiev. And she graduated with a master's degree in international journalism from Erebro University in Sweden. She's been reporting on events since the South Ossetian War. She reported in the Arab Spring for two years and as a freelancer her work has been published uh, in Ukrainian publications but she's also collaborated with outlets such as the BBC, The Guardian and The Independent. Um, but as I said her um, engagement is not limited to writing. She is the co-founder of the Public Interest Journalism Lab and chair of the public television company, uh, the NGO Hromatska. Natalia is also a filmmaker and author of three books which collected her three or fewer, three. There you are, three books which collected her reportages in uh, occupied Crimea and the Middle East. So since the beginning of the Russo-Ukrainian War, she's been reporting from the front lines in order to document Ukraine's wartime stories. And I'm also pleased to say that she has been working with the IVM, and we have established a great working relationship with her and the lab that she leads as one of the fruits of this collaboration really centrally is our program documenting Ukraine. Uh, as Natalia will doubtless explain to us, she's been collecting oral, written, and audio-visual material uh, of the war necessary not only for Ukraine itself, but uh, also for people who don't have direct experience of war and for researchers and future historians. The assembled uh, material will remain a testimony uh, to the to the future. The ultimate object of documenting Ukraine is to build an archive that will make this material accessible, and we're very proud that this is being hosted here at the EVM. And we've got an official launch of the second phase of the project with a public event. Uh, on the 7th and oh, uh, uh, the 8th of February, but we'll be having things going on on the 7th and the 8th. And uh, I uh, urge you all to look at the EVM website and to register uh, for that. So thanks to Kate Younger, our permanent fellow who's running the program, to Ksenia, uh, Ksenia Karchenko, who is uh, working um, tirelessly on the program, and also to Tim Snyder, who uh, has been the sort of spiritual mover behind it and also has raised uh, well virtually all the funds for it. They put a huge amount of work into this. Uh, anyway, that's enough for an introduction. I want to hand over to Natalia now, who's going to speak for about 35, 40 minutes. Then she and I are going to chat about life as a journalist. And uh, then we'll have some questions from the floor. And after that, of course, we have the legendary EVM wine and cheese down in the kitchen. So uh, you can all look forward to that. Natalia. Thank you. 
Um, it's always an honor to be here, and uh, I really, really immensely um, enjoy the talks here because I also myself can summarize some of the things which you know are the. Um, I sometimes forget that how essential they are while usual reporting, and I also have the challenge to say that I was talking here with Kate in. April, and somehow there are some things which I would repeat, and I'm happy to say that some things didn't change, in a way that the initial observation turned to be, you know, um, supported by more evidence about what what we talked about, what this war is about, and what the Ukraine is fighting for. Uh, but yes, I chosen this title, the frontline reporting. Uh, for in the Ukrainian war for democracy. Um, by this I mean not just Ukrainian democracy. And that's why I had explained. In the end, despite this lengthy, uh, lengthy uh, introduction, that's just the way Ukrainians can survive. They need to do everything all the time in any capacity. Uh, the, the, um, the, the real thing I'm doing, I'm really like a transmitter, somebody who is just passing by something I've seen firsthand. So uh, while I'm giving the lecture, uh, I think I'm just here to tell what I learned from the people. Uh, and uh, I think I've received the best lectures while reporting from the villages and towns all over Ukraine for these 11 uh, months. And um, by, by this, you would just he hear what. So I've been more or less uh, me, and I'm running the team. I'll tell a bit more about that later. Uh, we've been uh, of, of a dozen of reporters who are based all over the country. So I really kind of claim, I, I kind of understand what's going on. I've been to every single affected areas within this period of time and, you know, 24, all the time, more or less, spend uh, time to understand what's going on. Uh, so by this, I should say that the, they were the, that despite I thought I always know, I know my country, and I think any journalist can tell, uh, I've been learning really a lot, both about democracy and about Ukraine and about my people and about this war after every single trip. So the best lecture on the economy I've ever got uh, was when I was reporting uh, the industrial, one of the biggest Ukrainian metallurgical plant in Krivirich, uh, the birthplace and the place of uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. It's the biggest steel factory where when I was just chatting to the uh, engineers and the simple workers, uh, more or less of the age of their 40s, the, the people of the same age of the president, I was really asking like, so what are you doing here? Because uh, out of the uh, thousands, I think out of the 30 thousands of the people who were working in this uh, industrial, uh, in this industry at that town, um, which of course is also have its own troubles because of the you know lack of uh, the uh, roads, all the blockade they, they experienced. Uh, they had 2000, almost 3,000 people fighting in the front line. And he said like, you know, here, in this plant, what we do, we work, so in our plant, in, so our plant gives taxes to the city, and the city gives the taxes to the country, and country defends itself, so we help and save the world. That was his logic, and I said like, so what would you do next? And he said like, we'll work hard, so it all works, the world is saved, and so like, so what you would, till the victory. And then I said like, so what you will do after the victory? So like, we'll work harder to make Ukraine better. <laughs> and I think there won't be a better lecture of the connection of the citizens and the state and the industry. One of the best lectures on the, you know, on the, 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 the freedom of speech or something, I, I, I received also in the very same plant when I was talking to the person whose profession I never heard in Ukrainian. He is the one who working, uh, a metallurgist, also of 36 years old. And I, I really was also asking, you know, how your life changed. And he said that, uh, you know, that immensely what he's thinking about, what this war is about, and, um, you know, what makes Ukrainians different from, from Russians and, he, and for what he, you know, this fight is about. And he said, you know what? For freedom of speech. I was a bit 
you know, uh, surprised because as a journalist who would, uh, the Kiev-based journalist who, who for decades was trying to, you know, reach out to the civil society and explain even to the Ukrainian politicians why you need a full freedom of speech, why it matters, I was pretty surprised, but for him uh, it was very clear. Here I can express, it really matters for me that I can tell what I want and it's allowed. And uh, it turned to me that all these important things which we speak in, in, in such rooms, they really matter. I also learned a lot about not even the limit, the way how unlimited human courage is. So for instance, uh, I was again absolutely puzzled already in November when we were in the town in Mykolaiv region in a hospital where it was for nine months, uh, the hospital was under the Russian occupation, lived through the very difficult times, and there was a lady in a lab who do these uh, you know, blood tests, and she showed me the video which she recorded uh, with her team under the occupation on the Independence Day, um, when she uh, was with the Ukrainian flag, and you know, it was a death threat, you know, she would be died if somebody would see that, and with this flag, they recorded the video for themselves, not for public, not for something, but just to tell to their boss that by, uh, uh, by August 24th, they made 3,800 uh, blood tests, so the hospital is operational, they do their job and they stay Ukrainian under the occupation. They saved this video, they sent it just to their boss who was uh, forced to flee early, and that was the only reason. It was not for showing off, but that was quite an important that this civil duty and this duty of a person working in their office was kind of so important, which I also, in my journalism, I, um, I, I kind of, not, before the war, I haven't seen that, that often. I also learned a lot about the, um, the, 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 sorry, that uh, how much the military people, uh, the, 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 even the occupiers, be, would be afraid of the usual people and the people without guns. Uh, because in the same hospital, the chief nurse told me probably one of the most striking for me phrases of this war, uh, of, of something which I heard recently, that when the hospital was there for the nine months, uh, the military, the Russian military were coming, they were demanding the equipment, they were threatening life and death for the, uh, at least two of their chief, uh, chief doctors needed to flee. Uh, there were all kinds of horrors happening there, but they told to us that, they told to these ladies, mainly ladies uh, stayed in, in the hospital, said like, can, there was this Russian officer who told, who came to them and told like, can you do something with your people? And she said, like what? Can you tell your people be kinder to us, to Russians, because you are shooting us with your eyes? They, they, these people were fully armed against this, you know, fierceless female uh, Ukrainian small town uh, nurses, not even the doctors. But it was for me striking to say how these Russian military officers would be afraid of these ladies who actually are powerless but turn to be absolutely powerful in that particular environment. So there are all these things which I constantly amazed, and I do not definitely want to sound, you know, cheerful. You know, we're living through the horrors. There is uh, enough now that beyond what we do with the document in Ukraine, you know, actually uh, with number, we, we support with the IVM and we work, we made this program to support number of Ukrainian media to actually document the life, the life Ukrainians live through, um, you know, their resistance, their resilience, but the, the second project which is you know takes most of my time is the reckoning project uh, the uh, where we document war crimes and I should also say crimes against humanity and possibly even the attempt of genocide and I'm very confident about using these terms because we also have our legal expert in this room now and I know that anything which would be told by me in terms of how I define this crime so I'm very careful uh, I know it could be you know a challenge uh, because uh, in Indeed, within, uh, and that's something also I cannot mention, 
Uh, because of course, when we, we when we started, uh, I think even the international our international partners uh, they were you know trying to say to us Ukrainians that be patient, it would take years, and also it's very hard to verify the war crime. You need to have a lot of evidence, and you know it just it's very hard. But after a couple of months, we were already saying like we have enough, and we have already enough of evidence to speak about the crimes against humanity because. All around the country, uh, in ma many places, m all the crimes you have in international law, they've been committed. You, today, Ukrainian prosecutor's office is speaking uh, about around more than 60,000 uh, cases in which uh, probably the rules of war were breached. Uh, we see uh, m more or less we can divide then if the city isn't occupied, you know, it would be bombed, shelled, and there would be attempt to destroy it. If the city is occupied, there would be different types of crime, tortures, detention. And the difference is, especially for me who has been reporting the conflict uh, in Ukraine and the first invasion in Crimea and the Donbas, if there they were targeting the uh, active people, for instance, the, I don't know, the politicians, people who are, uh, I don't know, like human rights activists or people like that kind. In this regard, anybody who is not loyal to the Russian state, is not loyal to the occupier, occupiers, uh, could be under this threat. Uh, but why I'm really speaking about this war against uh, democracy and, way, uh, and the, war for democ uh, the, the fight for democracy, one of the patterns we also observe, and I personally, in our team, uh, just to say that we have around 20 journalists spread out around country, including the great Kiev-based reporters with a uh, record on human, human rights reporting, but also a lot of local reporters based in Kharkiv, in Chernihiv. Uh, one of them has been detained in Kahovka, you know, um, in the early stage of the war. So these are really people on the ground. But the, the cases I'm following, the incidents I'm following myself, and which I, as a, you know, somebody also looking at, at, at the stories of the society, was really about the attack on the local leaders and the local uh, authorities. So, for instance, just today, finally, I received, you know, the reply from some of our ministers that, that we have, you know, like, in Ukraine, around 100, 100 around 150 low, uh, heads of the local villages, which at different stage had been either detained uh, tortured, and um, some of them are still uh, in captivity. Some of them are, uh, uh, you know, maybe been freed, but we should understand that even if somebody has been captured and freed, the community remains beheaded, because even after the liberation, we understand if there is an, not a local uh, chief or local mayor or the village head, uh, it's very hard to rebuild the city. It's very hard to understand how many, you know, w w what support is needed. But what I think, uh, what I feel interesting, um, and uh, spe while we were we, we recording the in-depth testimonies of these people, uh, their interviews, uh, and I should also say that all kind of tortures were uh, involved. Uh, by this, we mean the beating, you know, freezing people out, beating severely, using electric wire. It's omnipresent, including on females, uh, because there were in Kherson the, the chambers where the females were kept. There were cases when teenagers were uh, were detained. All that happened, and we understand that it's not something which one group of the Russian platoon did, because the same things happening in Kherson, the same happen things in Kharkiv, the same things happening in various towns. Just in Kherson region, we have the you know uh, I won't be mistaken, 11 detention sites. Si in Kharkiv region, 23 detention sites. So it's all there. But what is uh, what was very uh, special in, in looking at these cases, as if the, the, the Russian soldiers which were coming, they genuinely didn't understand the motivation of these people. So for instance, one of our uh, protagonists, one of the witnesses we talked, was running a local pharmacy, by local, not a local pharmacy, self, kind of self-made pharmacy. What does it mean? When there is an occupation, there is no way to uh, to bring things, uh, to bring food, uh, to bring uh, drugs. Uh, so they would agree in the town that, look, let's just, you know, everybody has some kind of a kit, medical kit. So we collect it, 
And just on demand, you need this, you need that, you know, and it would share around our town. So numerous, numerous of these initiatives were around the country in the occupation. People were extremely creative in, they were self-running their places when the occupation was there. And they, they couldn't really understand who is guiding you, if you are a volunteer, if you are independent mind. It means there is something wrong with you. So they wanted to subdue these people, just breaking their independent mind because they have the independent mind. So there would be activists, there would be teachers, there would be anybody else, but there is a particular type of the people which would be, uh, which would be detained first. So, uh, and they would be the ones on, I, on whom I believe the the democracy is built on, the society is built on. Therefore, today, I also think that, for me, this, this case of, the, uh, of attack on the local leaders is actually one of the ways how to subdue the Ukrainian society. And they would do it unless the Ukrainians resist. The Ukrainian kind of luck is that it's not happening, but not mainly despite. Uh, so, given you a different anecdote, if I can use this word, um, you know, uh, we are on the end of, on the end of the year. I've been, uh, and I can again like you. You can learn just by going somewhere, talking to the people. In, in the end of the year, I met. Um, I, I was invited for the for the concert uh, in the administrative building of the Ukrainian Petrol Police uh, in Kiev. A huge building. Uh, it was not a, a coincidence. Uh, I, I would be very open. I have colleagues, friends in the in, in, in the police in the early stage of war. And in order to do the report, I spent uh, with my husband three first days in the war in the police department in being embedded with the police, looking what are the threats. Uh, you know, like what are the first days of the war in the police unit. Quite a lucky good place for the journalists to be, to be honest, spend nights with them, stay there. And, uh, you know, I came there, I was a bit amazed by the, you know, like a Christmas tree uh, where there was this toy uh, handcuffs from plastic, uh, you know, and there were people queuing in the line to pay their penalties. And I actually like this picture so much. You know, people play, paying the penalties for their traffic incidents. I was so relieved and happy to see that this police department is just so normal because I've been to dozens of the others which turned to be a torture chambers. And that was me the main. I was in the Zoom, in Balaklia, in Kherson, and clearly for me, the only thing I could see that it was a gigantic building and I thought like, if, if 11 months ago this building hasn't been invaded and the Kiev hasn't been defended, that would be a torture chamber. We all would be inside because I've seen how they are. The second thing, which I also felt was a bit on a different note, because there was this concert, and you know, um, you know, I've been my reporting for ten months, and then all of a sudden I started to meet these people who kind of um, spared their office for for us to sleep in in February. You know, brought the breakfast, asked if I'm okay back then. Exactly the guys who, with whom we went first to the uh, Irpinian Bucha when it was freed. Uh, and I was genuinely happy to see these people and also understood that I cannot ever imagine that these people, for, for them, for them torturing would be a normal job. Because when we were recording the testimonies of the uh, tortures done by the Russian occupiers in in, in, during the occupation, usually we, we kind of see the pattern. It's, it's, it's kind of as usual ritual. We can say that it's not like for them was something unique. It's as if there is a toolkit and they go in the morning to the office and, 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 and torture people. And I just was thought that, of course, it shouldn't be taken for granted and it's taken years for Ukraine to reform itself, especially from the Euromaidan, after the Euromaidan revolution. And again, you know, in Euromaidan revolution, there was a special riot police who killed the people, and there were the general, the Ukrainian general who killed Georgi Gangadze, uh, the employee of Minister of Interior in 2000. Um, um, so I understand that for me this proximity to the law enforcement is not something usual, but I was just absolutely sure that in this premise I'm secured, 
I'm defended and I don't see this people for this. So it was like as if it's a point of no return. So there is a year Ukraine went through this year, 2022, but also there are some of the years we went through and just we now can finally see the results of that. But also, when I'm often asked about various questions by international reporters, uh, you know, about Ukrainian identity or other things, quite often, I also think that, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes puzzled because within this year, I think that the biggest thing which really changed and which should be highlighted and which is the most interesting for me is the difference and the change in the attitude of the state and its citizens in Ukraine. Ukraine really had never had a state which defends itself. We always had a state which was an occupier, empire, maybe with one moment, Second World War, of course, there was the whole country, you know, uh, fighting the, the Hitler and Nazi, uh, but still, you know, a complex environment of Stalin and others, so I wouldn't compare that. But even when for 20, 30 years of the 20, probably first years of the independence, the state was there, you know, to govern, maybe to misuse its power, to do something, but you really never truly appreciated that. But just now, I think Ukrainians started to appreciate that <laughs> there is no way. And Ukrainians are defended because they have their own state. And that's a tremendous difference. Because there is no way, and that's something I learned myself, Ukraine always relied, as a lot of many societies in turbulent times, we relied on the exceptional individuals, heroes, maybe some political movements or something like that, uh, political parties. Uh, but today we know that it's just a legit army. Just a legit army can defend uh, the country from the army. There is no other way with a proper weapon. Because for me, it's very hard to accept somebody who coming from the human rights background, somebody who is coming from the, uh, you know, more or less like peace building initiatives. When I went to Kherson and the towns around which were hit by the Ukrainian army, I was partially amazed how precise these HIMARS, these rocket launch systems are, because I was used to see the houses destroyed. I have quite an understanding, though, if there is a war in the town, you know, okay, everything is shelled, nothing is left, and you just take it for granted. And then I saw that actually it makes sense when you really see that all the buildings are okay and just the building where the occupiers are is hit. So you're really kind of trying to accept that, huh, am I here to say that the weapon is good? Yes, some types of weapons are good. It's also something I learned too. Uh, but generally, um, so that would be the thing. There won't be way, that's what Ukrainians also understand, you know, to survive without the proper electricity grid. And you need a functioning system for that. And you need a functioning uh, healthcare system because no, there won't be volunteers who, you know, come and save that many people who are wounded and killed. Uh, there won't be opportunity of the bank operate for, for, in our case, there was not a moment when the Ukrainian banking system was not working. There was not a moment. And, uh, but I think it's also the, the, the way how the, you know, private companies work with the, uh, uh, with the uh, with the state companies, uh, as well, it was quite clear that it cannot be done uh, without a cooperation. Uh, you know, so for instance, when in Kherson the the mobile companies agreed, the people didn't have access for the Ukrainian mobile network. So the first weeks there, they just say like, "You use mobiles for free. That's it." because people have no capacity even to put the money on their mobiles because for months as they were not existing. So I think for me, it's also the issue that in the part of the world where we are, when we're a lot spoken about the democracy, about the freedom of speech and things like that, which I appreciate and which the metallurgist in Kriviri appreciate a lot, I, I started to think about a lot about the good governance as a part of the democracy in our part of the world. And I thinking it's about the, um, um, as a thing. I should also say that by, um, by now, I, I do believe that a lot of Ukrainians are consumed by constant feeling of guilt. Uh, by doing little. Uh, we're trying to find, and, and I talked to many people, understood that, 
And I understand that uh, the, the way to think about it, it's, it's about the feeling of the uh, duty, that you know you do something not because you're guilty, but because it's your duty. But I really, when we have any discussion, why the artists do these things, why the others do these things, why the journalists do what they do, I think the, the people are generally driven by the, by the, by the feeling of duty. And uh, I, uh, so, so, so that would be uh, where, where I'm standing on it. Uh, but why I, uh, again, putting it, why it's not just about Ukraine for me, I think we just have a very interesting example, you know, it, it, because there is a momentum. Uh, I think that the impunity which was in, in Chechnya and in Syria led to the impunity of the Russian army as such. The impunity in the international law was there. And also, so, so, so fighting this impunity is absolutely critical, and if we, you know, uh, do something with that and keep in different courts and it, by different means people accountable, uh, the, the Russian leadership, that would be a, a strong lesson for, for the other democracies. But also what for me, I'm still returned for the good governance issue. In um, Zaporizhia region, currently occupied as well, there was a very interesting story, peculiar story, which I mentioned that when we were trying to write a, a report, which would be still soon published, uh, we were discussing uh, the education, you know, like uh, indoctrination, the Russian propaganda and things like that. So there was a teacher in, not the teacher, a collaborator, it, uh, the person who was put in charge to run the local schools in the villages. And uh, she was first begging the other teachers because the the, the there was co there was COVID. Ukraine has a system of the online lessons. So especially in spring, uh, it was very complicated. It was an independent decision of everybody. Should the school go on in occupation under the bombardment? Should they do it online? Should at all kids not to study? So um, and of course this, the teachers in the occupation they were cautious that maybe they would be you know named collaborators if they work for the schools. It's different for the doctors, for the but it's still a bit of a great zone. So at first she was pushing these teachers to, to go for their work. And then she was threatening them that if you don't start working, you know, like there would be you know, some, uh, you know, you would, you would talk to, 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 to the Russian soldiers. But what was interesting, she never really meant those teachers to teach. What she really asked was, can you bring at least a couple of pupils so the Russian television would film them for the 9th of May? Which also brought this idea that, for me, still the democracy is about good governance, but what the, it's happening in, in the occupation, I'm not speaking for the whole Russia, but I'm speaking about the occupation, it's the picture for the Tsar, more or less. It's nothing about the... So for me, I think for quite a lot of time, the authoritarian regimes, especially in our part of the world, were trying to say, we are governing, we are strong. You, you know, like this fighting democracies, you are chaotic, you can't deliver. And what we felt during the war, that actually the Ukrainian state was delivering under the war, and that's kind of a normal thing for them to do. Why this authoritarian, huge hierarchical state even didn't meant to make something for the people. There were a lot of like weird positions they took from Gogol, you know, using the terms of gubernia, which no, never existed. In, it doesn't exist in, in Russian um, um, current uh, administrative system. It was just in Gogol, you know, or n before 1917, but they created Kherson Gubernia or, or Bereslav Gubernia, and there was a ministers of, this pe of these territories. So it was quite a, quite a strange, quite a strange thing for me. So this uh, probably uh, would be something with which I would be, and uh, yeah. So I, I'm I'm going to this to say that Ukraine is for me an exemplary case. Of course, because I'm Ukrainian, that's true. Uh, but also where, thanks to what we have, thanks to its transparency, thanks to openness of the society, thanks, thanks to quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of conditions, it's a place where if we prove it works, it works. If it doesn't work, that wouldn't be a better place to defend than, than current Ukraine. So all help would be needed. Um, so that... Uh, 
with that, I want to say that I do not want to sound romantic, I don't want to sound naive, and I do not want to search silver lining in the war. You know, we can discuss how technology develops, how society works. Uh, I still think uh, th the longer the war lasts, the more uh, toxic it's for the society. The fact that society keeps on, it takes a lot of effort. It really takes a lot of effort for people to remain resilient, humane. Uh, and uh, I wonder you know, how, how, how the things developed. Uh, that's why, that's the only reasons why Ukrainians are calling for ending this war as soon as possible. Because they know what's is a what is a toll. Um, and I feel very weird as a journalist, to quote the First Lady, I should be honest, I really feel strange about that in, in my tradition, but I was puzzled because I was listening to her talk uh, last week, she was in Davos, and she was really asked this very general question you really ask from the First Lady on the panel, you know, like, what is the future for Ukraine? What is, you know, like, it, it's a bit, you know, something for, for it. And she was very, you know, down to earth and said, like, you know, Ukraine should be the place of normality, of equality. It just should be for a world the, the place how, how the normal people react to what's to these horrible things. But I think we should be the pivot of peace because we know what it costs. So if we reach it, we know how to keep it together. So I do think it's something for me to uh, to say, but to finalize. What also I learned, and it's maybe not that much for the international audience, but I think it's something I want to share with my, my also Ukrainian fellows. I always thought that we are very, very, you know, Ukrainians are always complaining about something. Always. That they don't like things. That they always disappointed with, uh, with things. They are kind of gloomy people. But then I saw that I... These people actually fight for life. They don't like fight for freedom. We can speak about that. They, like, maybe I can say they fight for democracy. But actually what I really see is that people really fight for their lives basically to survive. It's a really, uh, and in all the choices, uh, which is something very interesting for me, because I was asking last week these questions to the war veterans, and that's why I feel I, I kind of, I, I'm legit to answer this question. So uh, the biggest dilemmas for everybody in Ukraine, and including for the Ukrainian leadership and the military leadership, and even for us, for journalists writing about that, is where to stop, uh, how to save lives. Because it's actually the most important question. It's the only important question, I should say. Should you leave the town and risk the life of your soldiers? Or should they stay for another week and die? Is it the way to, to move and withdraw, saving these lives? But if you withdraw, would you protect the people who are inside? Would you just give up as a sacrifice the people who are on that territory? And uh, what I also feel that if you really speak down to earth with everybody, and there is a, quite a public consensus apart from some you know, very open poetic papers, people usually say that saving lives is the most important. So it's not about bravado. I, I feel that still the the Ukrainians remaining very non-militaristic society in the times of war, which is very interesting for me. I also have another exercise, you know, um, and Misha would speak about how we practice journalism during the war. What is interesting for me, uh, because why it's easier for me to be a Ukrainian reporter covering the war in my country, because almost in every sphere I have somebody whom I trust. So I have human rights uh, human rights activists fighting in the army. I have, you know, people who were investigating tortures in the prisons fighting in the army. So I always can ask them, and anti-corruption activists fighting in the army. So I can always, even if informally, ask, how is there? What is the mood? And uh, we have this phrase, I try to, 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 to translate it. Uh, in fact, uh, everybody knows Taras Shevchenko in Ukraine, which is the most important Ukrainian poet. And kind of for for general public, the most famous book of his is his uh, will, where he speaks about how he dies and this kind of poem. But really the most popular phrase is in his, his, uh, his um, 
in his poetry is, uh, I'll say in Ukrainian, then translate, Sadok Vishnevi Kolohati, Hrushina Dvishnyami Huduj. So it's about the Ukrainian orchard, uh, you know, and the, you know, the, this is this picture of the Ukrainian village, pastoral, when the people are sitting in their house, and it's May, and the, everything is blossoming. And I'm always asking this question. So, how is the mood in the army? Is it this kind of, for what, what people are speaking about, what they want? Khrushchev and Vishnev, yes. So they're really saying, that the soldiers generally saying, yes, we want to be back to this kind of nice village type of the peaceful Ukraine, which for me is a sign that, you know, it's still more about life than a death. Yes, it's still about survival rather than revenge. Uh, it's still about, you know, humanity more than something else. And if you really speak about the political choices Ukrainian makes, I really think for a while we were dragged in the war about our past, which is very important. We have Timothy Snyder on board, we have a lot of people to discuss our past, but I think politically, this country lived through so many sufferings, this country lived through so many troubles, that today, People just choose those who choose life. That's it. And um, therefore, in, uh, therefore saying, if you really now listen to any talks about peace, something, today the victory and the military defeat of Russia, or at least the victory of Ukraine, is considered by majority as the only way to secure life. There is not, nothing else worked so far. So it's coming, it's this, this vision of victory, this vision of the even military fight today is really driven not by militarism, but the only self-security and just protecting very basic protection of your life because there is no other way so far. That's something I told. There would be a lot of other talks I made exactly 35 minutes. Thank you. Natalia, thank you so much. And can I say, I mean, it's difficult enough uh, extemporizing and, s and speaking uh, in that descriptive way in your own language, but to do it in another language is uh, really a tremendous uh, challenge and one which you uh, uh, meet with consummate ease, it seems to me. Um, I want to talk a bit about the actual practice of of journalism and the practice of journalism in in war. Um, so, al although you obviously had been covering the conflict in the East since 2014, um, uh, February the 28th takes it onto a whole new level. Can you give us a sense of what that experience is like? when all of a sudden your world is turned upside down by the presence of tanks, artillery, uh, infantry, air attacks, uh, and so on, but knowing that the job you do is one of the most critical jobs uh, in a situation like that. What does that do to you sort of psychologically, professionally, and so on? Um, so I'll give example, practical example. In our reckoning team, you know, it just it, it's a sample. It's it's not specially made. We hired the people because they are the best journalists in the region, not because there is something happening with them. In Kharkiv, one of our journalists' house flat was demolished. <laughs> in Chernihiv, our journalist house has been demolished. She her husband uh, was wounded and in the front line. In Kahovka, the journalist has been detained. In Kherson, the journalist needed to be away for nine months. In Mariupol, our editor found and found first connect with his mother and family in May. You can imagine what is, what is that. In Irpin, the house is unlivable. Uh, I'm, I'm giving yes, just some example. Another photographer spent two weeks in Butcher. Uh, one, one, uh, we started with him, he was mobilized, went through the most difficult battles, totally non-prepared lifestyle, e the best lifestyle editor in the country, I would say. But luckily, but th three, weeks three weeks ago got a, a medal 
for the courage. <laughs> so, you know, another, so you, you really see that it's, and I won't even speak that so many of them have their families in the occupation. Uh, but I think this is not what we think about, at least how I explain it. That's not because we are journalists, but because we are citizens of Ukraine. So in this we are equal. We shouldn't say there is a problem for the journalists in Ukraine. There is, but this is a problem of the Ukrainian citizens. The dilemma is really how to you do your work. Because I still treat the, the, the full-scale invasion, full invasion a bit like a hurricane, a bit like a natural, natural disaster. Because if you don't have a power, you don't have the, the, uh, to write, and we are totally dependent on internet today. I was talking to some of our you know, fellows who've been in, 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 in the 90s in the Balkans, and they said, like, oh, but we can write. And it's like, I wish I would be able just to write with my pen, but nobody would accept my writing in a pen. The way we operate is just different. And you cannot, you know, you really cannot work without, uh, without energy in modern world. This journalism is not happening uh, beyond all the other, all the other things. Mm, so I still, I, I would understand that journalism is really too close to politics. Almost every major politician, I think beyond Putin and our president, were journalists at some point, uh, you know, from Lenin to anybody. But the, so it's really political. But still, I would prefer to compare myself to a firefighter, to a doctor, because uh, when... And I think that there is a difference between being objective and being emotional. Being objective for me and trying to tell the truth is more about not to lie and, and follow the rules. You know, if I know that Ukrainian army is not willing or doing something wrong and I'm hiding that, that's wrong. That's when I'm not objective. But when I'm getting emotional, I don't, I don't see a problem with that. I see it just normal. Because I remember for me, the answer of that when I was in, uh, in a village in uh, Harrison region, and we went to see the firefighters, village firefighters, men, Ukrainian men in their, 40, in their 50s. And we just came, and they started to cry. I mean, this man, village men, they start, and they started to hide. I, we, we, I didn't ask anything. They just started to cry right away. Uh, because probably they are village firefighters who fight, you know, who need to uh, put a fire, to stop the fire in their houses. They never were meant to do this, you know, they never seen bombs. It's not even a town. What is a firefighter in a village? And honestly, I don't know who of them is doing their job, who is not. I cannot claim that every of them is a hero and does his job perfectly. Maybe, and I'm quite sure, there would be some who weren't able to work properly, who kind of, you know, stay away. Maybe somebody need to overperform because not everybody is able. We see this problem in the hospitals. Honestly, a lot of doctors left. Those who stayed, they're incredible, but there were those who fled. They fled with the different reasons. I need to save my family, I need, uh, you know, like, it would be so dangerous. We had the, the doctors fled, but we had doctors stayed. So in this regard, I wouldn't, you know, separate us from any other profession. On political level, I think, yeah, of course, as for the, any kind of intellectual public figures, we bear more responsibility. Uh, but I believe the job of the journalists who do this job as firefighters is more essential. Now, uh, one of the things that happens when a conflict like this um, uh, blows up is that there is suddenly an, another type of invasion, and that's an invasion of journalists from the rest of the world. Um, they are very, very dependent, although uh, their audience don't, necessarily realize this, they're very dependent on Ukrainian journalists, Ukrainian producers, Ukrainian fixers. What has that experience been like um, for something as monumental as, as this? Do they get in the way or do they help? Um, 
both, of course. First of all, I think it's a better time than probably years ago, where, uh, where I think that um, the international newsrooms are open more for local voices. They wouldn't treat Ukrainians just as translators. But it still very much depends on the, uh, on the media. There are good media, there are bad media, there is television. <laughs> Always, you know, like as a print reporter, you would say, because sometimes uh, I've given you a different example. Um, um, and there are people in this room who would confirm because they were there. I've been once in, I was invited, I was in Kharkiv, where colleagues of mine uh, were uh, trying to establish the a kind of the media hub, because Kharkiv at that time was under their assault. And uh, these uh, poor press officers couldn't handle these thousands of journalists. By the way, if you really you know, put a number of the, uh, the press card uh, in, in, you know, a number of the press card given by the Minister of Defense, mine is 19, the last I've seen was like 11,000. It doesn't mean that they're all international, it's also about the Ukrainian, but it's just speaking about the scale. So there were all of these, um, all of these uh, press officers, and the journalists wanted to do something what they've done international in Bucha, in Irpin, you know, go and see the things. But it was still an actual, partially actual battlefield. So the, 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 the military were absolutely cautious, and there was a mess. The, the, they were paying bribes, they were trying to find their way, they were going a different, you know, dangerous road. So the idea was also by journalists, by, by journalists saying, like, we cover, we love our Kharkiv, we need to organize this work in Kharkiv, so there is no mess, that there is some kind of thing. And it was quite an interesting way when initiative came from, from the local media to organize the work of the international reporters and help the military to deal with them. So both provide access, but kind of handle. My role was to, as, coming, as somebody coming from Kiev and writing to international media to persuade the press officers that the access is important, the Ukrainian state wants international reporters to show, uh, to show the, the, the reality on the ground, and that we have rules. And there were these 14 different press officers, and they were trying to self-organize, which was also for me quite an interesting case of the self-organization and the journalists being mediators. And I think I did everything, everything right, we agreed on something, and the next day, we go somewhere, and there was this Italian television. I would say that it's Italian. I think I can tell it it's Italian. But they done everything which they were told not to do. They went where they were not told to, tell, to, to go. They filmed a person which shouldn't be filmed. And we were so annoyed that I was like, I better don't put them anywhere. So this kind of person in me was like, I just yesterday claimed to all these press officers that the journalists have rules. And just, it was... Playing on my side, everything was broken. So I think it's really different, uh, but I think because it's Russia, not also because it's Ukraine, the story isn't there. Ukraine is interested in coverage. It's still true that Ukrainian, uh, in Ukrainian government officials are way more open for international media. They do leak the stories first to New York Times or CNN rather than to Ukrainian media. Uh, they, I think there was a kind of, uh, there, there is a competition and a bit of the offense of the Ukrainian media. Ukrainian media would never have touch, such resources. So it's, it's different. Um, but I say I'm grateful to most because there is a lot of good coverage. Uh, I know there would be always a lot of bad coverage and I still salute those poor independent reporters who coming, you know, like I, I've met some photographers who, they live in Kenya, but you know, on New Year Eve, that the only time they are, because all the Americans need to go for Christmas and this poor photographer from Nairobi would go to cover Ukrainian story for a major Western paper for New Year Eve. And he's so happy and he does and he loves the country. So I do think that if it's a genuine, I still would always separate, myself being a freelancer, we need to salute those who put an effort to understand the country and need to help. Uh, we understand that the big media matters, but there would be a lot of bad journalism still. Now, um, uh, you referred to the, the Balkan Wars and talking to some fellows. I, of course, I, I covered the Balkan Wars as BBC correspondent then. The experience that we had was 
very, very different. You alluded to it by saying that for you, energy was essential. Well, energy was essential for us, but in a different way because we didn't have access to means of communication. So we would be covering a, st covering a story and for it to have any sense, we would have to get to a telephone. And that was really tricky. Only the very biggest organizations had sat phones, which tended to be in Sarajevo. But if you were outside of uh, Sarajevo, getting to a telephone was really, really uh, difficult. And also, um, your deadlines were pretty clear. My deadline was, you know, for the, for the midnight news, for the, for the six o'clock, for the one o'clock. And... Uh, uh, and I knew I had to meet those deadlines, and if I missed it, I would be in trouble. And but that was that was that. Since then, of course, the internet has come along, and the whole experience that you're having is entirely different. Can you explain what the what the how news has changed and what that means if you're covering a story? I I think that the the it's not like just social media, but this <coughs> demand to be now, to tell now is really, you know, psychologically extremely difficult because it creates an absolute anxiety. By the time you are out of the place and you get your story, probably it's already dead. So you really technically work between the time when, for instance, there is liberation of Izum, there is no internet connection there, you really need to be there to come fast and write something. If you make a brilliant story in the evening, probably it won't any longer work because somebody with a tweet would really, you know, cover it. And the point is that it's endless. It's endless that you can publish at 2 a.m., 5 a.m. for the American time, for, for other time. There is no stop. And uh, uh, I, I really feel that I have this luxury, I, I do have this luxury with working on the long-term projects like Documentary in Ukraine, like the Reckoning Project, that we have some ends, we, we work on the films, we work on the larger articles. But I see my, my, my I have a lot of friends who are editors, who are editors-in-chief on bigger newsrooms. They cannot afford to stop reporting on Telegram for a second. 3 a.m., 4 a.m., wherever they are, it's never, it's never over. Uh, no, at night there is no deadline, and it's probably a huge, huge, huge anxiety. I think it's a huge anxiety for the, uh, of course, international reporters, but for the Ukrainians, I don't think that they have a, a time to to take shifts, uh, you know, or even if you organize that. At, uh, for instance, if you're a reporter, uh, you really never stop, and you, but you, you, you feel guilty. You do feel guilty if you don't report because you think you ought to. So. It's 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 where the trouble is by uh, and uh, and I do think it's not really fully understand how this kind of time demand is what is toll it has to the uh, minds of the reporters nowadays. Yeah, I I notice it's more difficult to read longer extended pieces that basically you follow the news through tweets and through through radio bulletins and things like that, and of course reporters are also expected to be tweeting the whole time. I mean, I just wonder when they get the time actually to sit down and, and write anything, because some of them are tweeting literally hundreds of times a day. It's quite extraordinary. The experience is entirely different. But that's why I would claim what, why what we do is so essential, because you would never find those tweets any longer. They, they just disappear. Yeah. Um, so that's why what we are doing should mm. be in parallel. Maybe it's not so much appreciated at the moment. You know, maybe it's not doesn't travel that well, but that what would remain. Now you were arguing to me yesterday that the nature of the war in the former Yugoslavia and the nature of the war in Ukraine is fundamentally different. Can you elaborate on on that? What what you mean by that? So I think that it would be very uh, not right for me to tell that you know this war is more crystal clear, black and white because we're Ukrainians. That's definitely not the case. Uh, I mean, like I don't think that any nation, any ethnic group, or anybody has some kind of pre pre decisive way. Uh, but I believe that uh, the thirty years of the development of Ukraine 
and especially last eight years, even if this war would be fought in 2014 in this way, it would be a different war. The fact that it's accountable, there is a society, there are the rules, there is this kind of <clears throat> democratically elected parliament, parliament, government, opposition, already established independent media with a tradition of doing it differently, it makes it different. Because I was thinking, I really, uh, again, like I, I think it's also in this room at IBM, a lot, a lot of people, and <laughs> you yourself, who are way better expert in the Balkan wars. So I don't want to be this arrogant and to say, like, I know how it was. But I, I, I still think that uh, some of the troubles of the society and the problems and crimes which has been committed were also committed because the time difference between the Yugoslavia was non-democratic and the war were fought, was very short. So, of course, the, the governments and the regimes and the, you know, the countries were run by a different type of people. I believe, unfortunately, that if this war would be fought in 1995, the Ukrainian army, would they do cover-up of different things they would do? Yes, they would do. Would Ukrainian police, you know, like, would torture people, uh, prisoners? Probably yes, but if I have you know an IT specialist who work in London in McKinsey and now somewhere in Bakhmut, I don't think he he he, do, he would do it differently. And as well, I'm trained differently to treat journalism and you know like to uncover the things to speak about my government. So I, I do think that it's also not really just a blessing or something unique, but the work of the society. Uh, so so I, I, and uh, in in this regard. Unfortunately, Georgia had a war, and, and Moldova had a war uh, in, in, in the early stage during the, you know, like the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Ukraine was lucky not to have. Some people would say, you know, like maybe we should do have something back then. But I do think that if we really come from the premise that sooner or later this war should happen, and the Russia wanted to, you know, rebuild the Soviet Union, Ukraine is definitely in a better shape to defend itself and be stable and remain human and you know adhere to the rules mainly because it's open and democratic liberal society before i throw it open to the audience Rupture. i want to ask a very no a very uh, personal question okay. i mean during the yugoslav wa wars more or less uh, all of the reporters that I know, and particularly those who experienced a lot on the front line and particularly those who were investigating the consequences of uh, atrocities and so on, suffered from some form more intense or less intense of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, your talk was uh, uh, about the front line. You have uh, experienced some pretty pretty awful things. Do you recognize that in yourself and your your colleagues that you are experience a very peculiar type of, of trauma which might be with you for a long time? Um, I definitely recognize in some of the colleagues and it's extremely acute. The important part of that, what we understand because, you know, it's already well developed. There are a lot of like DART center which work with us, you know, help the journalists who report trauma. So there are some tricks of self-care and things like that. We have the, uh, we actually, you know, also a privilege, you know, built on, on, on the people, you know, that, that thanks to the fact that people suffered so much and the journalists, there was these centers established and, you know, we are in a better shape. We are warned about a lot of things. And uh, uh, myself, no, I don't admit it. I think I'm fine. I have to be. I run the team. Uh, and I think that um, I can be very angry. That's I feel I, I should be a better human and more patient. <laughs> so so that's that's it. But I, I, I think that it, it probably would have a different uh, toll. Um, also, do something else. I felt more difficult covering eight years of war previous years of war, because it was a bit like, a, you know, trying to call a bell and nobody hears it mm -hmm. when I was reporting Crimea. And for mm -hmm. me, that was always the most painful experience. When you come from Iraq to your friends and they say, like, don't speak about work. And you're like, what I'm supposed to talk about your dogs, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. 
now uh, now it's different. And also, even like the Crimea and Donbass became very marginal topic uh, in some way, and you felt like you're a bit insane. You know, you're coming to these people talking and spoiling their parties all the time. Now I. Now everybody share. It's everybody's story, and you have something to tell. So I think, you know, it's not for everybody. But this thing that you in a, you know, like you understand it's not just your experience. I do think it's actually uh, <laughs> oddly enough, oddly enough, makes our life a bit easier because you're not an outsider. You're coming to the to the same society, which yeah, like like that understand your your your, your troubles. Thank you, Natalia. I'm going to throw it open to the audience now. I would ask you, please, uh, if you have a question, to state your name and if you feel like it, an affiliation as well. Thank you very much. My name is Mylinda. I am a journalist by profession. I come from Kosovo, so I'd like to share a short experience that I had recently that my follow-up to what you just uh, said as your last sentence following the question of trauma. So in the 90s, I was just a teenager and I experienced the war in Kosovo. And uh, when the war started in Ukraine, I was asked to go and report in the border between uh, Poland and Ukraine. And uh, while I was reporting, I've got emotional. And uh, there, I realized that actually I still have the trauma from 20 years ago, which I never dealt with. But when I was seeing another similar story happening, it's just open up, it came to me. So there is a trauma just to, to wrap up in, in, in that aspect. And another, uh, there was a question to me asked when I went back and report, what was the difference between uh, refugees of Kosovo back then and refugees in Ukraine? And I could see this difference because refugees in Ukraine were coming from a country that was well established. So they were not going through uh, suffering for, let's say, uh, decades uh, of repression. But in the case of Kosovo, it was the other way around the refugees were devastated when they were leaving. I believe that nowadays, if I go and report, it would be a similar picture to that because Ukrainian people are now devastated because I was reporting like in the ver very first days of uh, the Ukraine. This is just a short uh, a sharing of stories of journalists. My question would be related to one of the short sentences that you mentioned was bad journalism. What do you mean by that? Because this is a story now that I'm covering as a PhD student here, uh, dealing with your with a war in Ukraine, reporting on the war. So in generally, just like a Monday, this Monday when we have the uh, the um, we have the the Zoom gathering of our team on the reckoning project and they are based all over the country and decided to, to you know, dis we, we're talking to the witnesses of uh, crimes. And they, somebody started to explain that, you know, sometimes it's hard to persuade some of the people to talk, especially, and f what I understand that most of the people, most of the people who talk to journalists are dissatisfied with this experience. Like every almost every victim who said they didn't have a pleasant experience with journalism. Uh, I think that the journalists are not very sensitive. They they put a lot of cliche. Uh, they uh, you know are not careful about the people. They don't understand it well. So there are a lot of things. Sometimes they just get it wrong, and sometimes they just tell a different story. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the difference is whether this journalism come to understand what's going on or to be on the front page, or to be just live, to be there first. Uh, I'm giving a totally different example. Uh, I had this a very long discussion, because you won't remember, it was a big thing for Ukraine when we were expecting for the first really big liberation in Kharkiv region. Not in Kharkiv, it was about the liberation of her son. And there was this trick that Ukrainian army played that a totally different region was, uh, was mm -hmm. uh, there to be liberated. And all the international press went to 
Kherson region, where and there was absolute kind of stop on coverage. And this hotel was, and I came for a different reason. And this hotel full of international reporters trying to sneak in, trying to sneak in. And they were complaining, telling that Ukraine is not democratic, that what the hell the Ukrainian army should show, all this type of the things. And then I should understand, like, why you want to be there? Why you really want to be there? Would it make a difference for you to be four hours later there? Because what is happening, what is wrong things which are happening, if you tell that the region is liberated too early, there would be basically people going under the shelling, the civilians, trying to get to their village, despite. It would also open the position, so there are a lot of like real life risk. And, and I was like not even arguing because I didn't want to defend, but I was really saying like, what is difference for you to know and to tell this story some hours later? Honestly, no reason, apart from being the first. And that's bad journalism, even though the being the first is a good thing. Uh, taking two questions, one and the gentleman at the back, two. Okay, my name is Katrin Kalwert, I work with the Deutsche Zeitung. I want to make a comment before I ask the question. The comment is, actually I do, obviously I come from the other page because I'm not Ukrainian, but my experience in this war as a journalist is that the cooperation between Ukrainian and foreign journalists has gotten much better, much more intensive because we work as equals. It's not, I used to have stringers who drove the cars, or I don't know who translated now. It's, you know, who can give whom what 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 support? Who can travel with whom? Where? Who can t call whom? When? And it's and the, when you say that the reporting uh, and the leaks go to Washington Post and New York Times, I think that's partially because this is I, a media war for the West as well, and I think yeah. it's important it goes there. And because the cooperation, except especially with those with those big papers, is excellent. So that was my comment. So the question is. You say and and it you know I'm just trying to f um, go follow along that that um, that route. Um, when leaks do not go to Ukrainian media, can it be because part of the media um, are mostly working with social uh, uh, as social media because the m the media marathon is. Um, something that is not really working as as an individual, you know, reporting anymore because media the marathon is you know all the t t television stations working together and because there there is partially m uh, military censorship so obviously p people are keeping to that so maybe there I it's more difficult to report in Ukraine or is it not I'm not sure. Uh, no, no, no. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I think it, it's okay t for me to understand why CNN would be the first to get to Kherson. It's just like for the Ukrainians, it's very important that they are all there. Uh, so I th I'm, I'm not really, I'm just saying like the sentiments which is existing. I have the privilege to work for international media, so which I honestly, I feel this privilege and I've been together with my colleagues and I knew that sometimes we give interview because I say, we work for the international, you know, like so meaning like I see as a Ukrainian, I, I see the different treatment. But it's not really, it's, it's clearly because there is an interest, you need to give an exclusive. Uh, but no, there is a bunch of independent Ukrainian um, papers. Their work is more political, it's about Ukrainian politics and the war. Um, so uh, uh, there is something which probably I should say, and we discussed before, and we didn't uh, uh, we, we didn't cover. That's why I didn't cover it in lecture because I thought that would be in part of the question. It's really about the censorship and the uh, the self censorship. Very interesting time to talk. Last four days we went through the four anti-corruption investigations. Because there was a lot of, I, I finally can comfortably answer this question. Because for the last uh, months, often, I was asked questions whether there is a censorship in the Ukrainian media, whether Ukrainian media are able to investigate the army and things like that. So on, th on Saturday, we have finally, there was a leak inside of the Ministry of Defense to one of the papers and to very famous anti-corruption activists that there is the corruption in the procurement of the food for the soldiers which are, you know, not the uh, front line, but the safer part of the country. Logistical support. Logistical support. No, food. So it was about that the eggs, potatoes, 
bread cost more. So it's not logistical. It's really like basically... No, I meant the, yeah. the soldiers who were involved in logistics. Yeah. So the soldiers, yeah. So the f whole weekend, the Ukrainian Facebook was like, what a shame. There was even the discussion whether it was right to do. And there was this discussion. The Rammstein is happening at this day meeting. And there was quite a thoughtful thought by this anti-corruption activist and a journalist whom I know who who did procurement for for do for, for dozen years for for twenty for last ten years, and he said that he really consulted a lot of people. He given the time for MOD to to respond, and he was really responsible. And because of this trust to him and the way what he did, actually he was not really bullied for you know making anti-corruption scandal during the you know this this very important gathering. So it was. He did a lot of important things. Oddly enough, for me, the MOD did things wrong in the communication. They wanted to despise that on Sunday. On Monday, the parliament committee gathered, uh, discussed that. The deputy minister resigned. On Tuesday, I couldn't really say that. So, I, and, and I think that there were a couple of other people who resigned in different cases. There was a case of the one guy uh, in the prosecutors in the the, the Ukrainian prosecutors uh, leadership went to Spain with his uh, working work car uh, business car um, to Spain to see his family for the holidays uh, which is not of course right uh, but I should say I don't defend them I just need to explain that a lot of people have their families and it's me traveling here always feel like oh I need to go to Europe again I better stay in Ukraine but I've seen this man this Ukrainian man who for a year haven't seen their families. Uh, but it's not an excuse. The, on, the, the interesting part that he needed to resign, and then there was a bill issued that the Ukrainian state officials are not allowed to leave the country unless it's an assignment. There was another case on Sunday when the uh, police chief, petrol police chief in Lviv kind of presented some parking permission for his girlfriend. She was stupid enough to publish it on social media. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the police needed to, you know, put him away a couple of hours later, a couple of hours of later. So I think, and one, the deputy head of the office of the president, without evidence, who was just suspected, and there were rumors in the media that he might be suspected into some corruption scandals, but not really of the kind of immense scale, but some of them, he resigned. So the point is that I saw that there were investigations, there was a reaction. It doesn't mean it's enough, but for me, it was just, I, I kind of feel confident to say that, not potentially, that I think if something happened, the Ukrainians would publish. It happened this week. It given me a good answer for this moment to tell <laughs> that I am not inventing that. I hoped it would be like that. It happened. Uh, at the back there, gentlemen. Uh, Natalia, first of all, uh, thank you for your talk. It, it's really very interesting. And uh, uh, can you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm Andrei Richter. I'm a professor of media and uh, also a native of Ukraine. Um, to add to what you just said, uh, I, I would like to, to also to maybe it was not mentioned that Ukraine has martial law since the 24th of February of, of, of uh, last year. And uh, I believe that in many, if not all European countries, if a martial law is introduced for, for a long period of time, there will be attempts much more stricter than in Ukraine to establish control over the media. Uh, but I have two short questions. The first question is that, um, as far as I remember, before the war started, before February, uh, there was uh, a lot of discussion among the journalists in Ukraine and, and the public as well as to whether there should be objective journalism or patriotic journalism in the country. There were sort of two factions between the journalists or among the journalists. Patriotic journalists were taking objective journalists and uh, so-called so objective journalists were taking patriotic journalists uh, as saying, you are not the real journalists, we are the real journalists. What happens with that today, if anything? Uh, is it a forgotten topic today? Uh, it will it go on when the war is over? That's the first question. And the second question is about Rain TV or Dost. Uh, I, I recall some years ago, uh, you wrote an opinion 
uh, I believe so, maybe I'm wrong, uh, as a member of, uh, of a body which, uh, which consulted uh, on, on media standards, uh, on, on the, uh, when, when the national regulator uh, abolished the license for RAIN TV, for Russian RAIN TV uh, television company in Ukraine for their violations of, of the law, pretty much similar to those which happened uh, a couple of months ago in Latvia. Uh, and you were, uh, you were against uh, the, the decision, uh, and you provided your reasons. Uh, um, two months ago, a similar story happened in Latvia, and uh, uh, what is your attitude to, to the story with uh, RAIN TV? Uh, uh, is it really a threat to national security? Oh, I mean, you cannot probably assess it okay, okay. properly, but, but what is your opinion? Okay, I, I know Andre worked for media freedom for many years, so that's why I understand where questions coming from, especially in our region. So I think that there is one thing. I don't think it's really about, am I patriotic? Yes, I am. I think the meaning and the genuine meaning of this word really changed. How you can be non-patriotic, it's in the country with a foreign invader killing your people. You are. Would you doubt that what is happening is wrong? No, you won't. Would you, you know, it just really is about, you know, good and bad, good and evil. And I do think we are all sophisticated people. We think that we are, you know, it's a bit banal and naive, and maybe even you don't want to be stupid to tell that some black is white and white is black because it's so banal. But I think it's a part of the problem in the board, not a problem, but it's an issue of a lot of media. It's just sometimes hard to accept that it's just so evil and and uh, and good, because you would. You kind of you would be respected or won't be considered smart, uh, and it, it takes some time to to to, to say that. Um, I by, th by the way said like, what would you sell in the country that there is no one affected? But uh, so so I'm returning to this idea of the firefighters. There are particular professional rules you follow. All the rest doesn't matter. You don't lie. You do what you do. And um, a, a lot of people who think that the journalism doesn't work, they are in the front line. They went to fight. And, you know, if I was in, if you asked me this question in April, I thought, like, I'm doing something, you know, I'm doing journalism better. I can address this audience. I probably am more useful in, 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 in here than, you know, in the front line. I would be an absolutely useless soldier. But after so many friends, and colleagues who could be the best editor, video editors, the best writers, the best anybody were killed in the front line. I really appreciate these people who given their life. Despite everything, it was the biggest sacrifice, anything else. So I have a huge respect to any professional in Ukraine who really takes this decision because it's still optional. You know, you, you can be called and mobilized, but still for a majority, is a decision to give your life, not to have a moment to go to Vienna. I have a colleague who was our editor and she decided she could be a perfect, you know, in any international project, but she decided to be mobilized and she fights in the, in, uh, she, she doesn't fight, she, but she has no minute. She is on duty. She lost her freedom. She given up her freedom and a lot of people given up the life. So I should say that a lot of people who really you would think like over patriotic, they actually went to, to do it differently because a lot of people think that the journalism doesn't work for them any longer. That was the reason why they were maybe a bit overboard, um, uh, you know, more, more emotional than the others. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, on the uh, on the TV rain, there was a moment when at that time I think that they violated the, the rules of the national uh, by by kind of coming Crimea through the Russian territory. I think what happened in Latvia is absolutely unfortunate. Uh, I know the case uh, and I don't think it's about the threat of the uh, national security of Latvia. Uh, there was absolutely wrong thing what the journalist told. 
uh, I know the reason, I know the person, I know he made mistake, but unfortunately the channel didn't find the right tone and didn't really consider Ukraine in this discussion. I think it was more about their own presence in, in Latvia, their own inner issues, the issues about how you... So, so I think that there are problems, there are absolutely problems in some of the, um, you know, in the part of the Russian community, including those who migrate, not by the reason that they fully do not, uh, maybe, how to say it, it's still all about them. <laughs> it's still not about Ukraine. It's a bit of the egoistic issue, and that's why for Ukrainians it's very difficult to, 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 to get this tone, because this tone is not about the war in Ukraine, it's about our troubles living in Russia, mainly in, in, in the coverage. Uh, but there is something I missed, and I really want to get it. We didn't talk at all about propaganda, and it's quite a difficult thing, but I do think that a, a lot, a lot of the, the Russian propagandists ha should be legally accountable for what they do. It's any longer not at all about different ideology, different media or something. It's not just a case, hate speech, it's a call, of, a call for war. It can be proven. It, it, it's where they, you know, the, 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 a lot of Russian media really created the, the, uh, the, they, they played a huge role that their soldiers are fighting and killing the people. Uh, so uh, we can, I can come to, come to a lot of real examples when the propagandistic campaign led to murder of the particular people. And those people who torture the people, they actually rationalize their murder and execution of the Ukrainians by quoting the Russian uh, propagandistic media. They quote, they really refer to that. So, you know, uh, w when we talk to specialists, so the cases of the... Um, of Rwanda and the others uh, genocides where the media were used for the murder of the people that's something when we can we, we can speak about the Russian media and I, I, I can't under uh, I'm speaking about the propagandistic media uh, overall um, we've got time for one more question um, this gentleman here in the, the front the smartest in the room thank you Natalia. <laughs> uh, I know uh, Debates on Europe uh, and the S. Fischer Stiftung. Uh, Natalia, I will not treat you as the first lady, but I would like to ask uh, a more general question, though. Uh, referring to what you said in your, in your lecture, you said that in the past Ukraine has relied on heroes and um, individual heroism. Today we know, you said, uh, that the only way we can be protected is by a regular army and to have a regular army you need to have uh, a an ordinary society, a working society, health care and, and, and so on. I would however still argue that uh, there is a lot of heroism uh, in Ukraine and uh, the Ukrainian project is very much a national project. I am a Swede and Sweden joined the European Union in the mid 90s at the same time as the as Austria did uh, and if not before we learned then that uh, the time we live in and uh, the future is post heroic and post nationalist uh, or post national uh, this is a difficult question uh, but how does the ukrainian project that is manifesting itself so uh, impressively in this heroism and is building uh, uh, the nation as it goes, how it is, is it compatible with this um, view uh, of Europe? No, I really think that, um, mm, I and I, I don't know I, whether it's cliche, what's considered to be cliche, that of course, there are a lot of wars are fought uh, on the name, you know, the words nation, nationalism are there. I really think that there is something Ukraine was not, and, and that's something which we are also discovering. We always thought about the civic uh, identity of the Ukrainians, that Ukrainians are political nations. And, you know, I didn't care that much about that. And it just became so obvious for me. I really became, I started to collect people of, 
various ethnic groups in Ukraine, you know, who are there, from Hungarians to Romanians, from Jews to Crimean Tatars, anything. And it's, 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 it's really, I even don't mention, you know, the point for me was interesting that I even don't mention the Crimean Tatars in government. When I was recently in, in um, on the talk, and there was a Crimean Tatar, uh, the, one of the representatives of the head office speaking about something, and after her, an Afghani veteran, after th then, it, it's just normal for us. So I think that's, that's one thing. Um, uh, the second is, if you speak about a heroism, uh, I really like this idea that, uh, you know, this and something totally different. I think after the, the uh, 1990s, uh, of, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, we, sp we were speaking a lot about uh, capitalism and the free markets. And I do think that a lot of people of the, uh, the part of the, uh, the part of the trauma that the people of the general professions, you know, felt a bit abandoned. So it's very hard to be proud communal worker, electrician or janitor really very hard <laughs> you know like or if you are a railway worker and of course it was the economic thing now i'm driving ukraine with the boards where you see the firefighters electricians and everybody understood that these professions mattered and when you go to the railway you actually really appreciate this person and when i saw it, it's still about a harris but maybe it's something new to me the first i, I remember this was moment when I was, um, uh, I couldn't buy a, a ticket for the second class, which is a usual thing for me. Uh, and I just said like, I better buy the, for the first class. And I said like, why the whole life I was buying these second class tickets? It's better to travel first class. I can't afford it cheap in Ukraine. And I told it to sister and said like, so buy, you would support Ukrainian railway. Somebody need to pay for that. Somebody need to pay first class. And I said like, what is thinking? And then it was this interesting moment for me then. I just didn't experience it earlier. That's why I appreciated it a lot. I appreciated my railway. I appreciated that I was in the train station and I saw like, hmm, there is a policeman not threatening me, but opening a door and checking my security. There is this guy from the railway who helping me. There is this post office. I really finally feel in this country cared. I never felt, I honestly didn't, I always was fighting this country. I was fighting the state. I was fighting these politicians. I, I really didn't, think, and I think that that's something which Ukrainians, by the end of the year, it's not perfect, I should say. But we are a bit like, could it be different? We never thought it could be different. And, and, and I think that's, that's, that's an interesting moment. Again, like, things won't be delivered. Things get worse. But this is something to, 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 to cherish and build upon the state, the state where would be different roles, where would be place for the firefighters, policemen, not just the, uh, the and, and the example of the success would be not just, a, I don't know, a successful businessman from the Silicon Valley and, and, and a person like that. Now, those of us who know Natalia really admire her extraordinary energy, courage, and uh, commitment. Uh, I think we've been very privileged this evening uh, to listen to Natalia and hear her experiences and her analysis. Before we go down and have some wine and cheese, I've only really got one thing to say to Natalia, and that is keep up the good work and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed for being here. Thank you. For